Hi, my name's Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the Lance 825 today. Uh, starting right up front here, we have your propane compartment. Now this uh, compartment houses a single 20 pound propane cylinder uh, held in place with a tension band here. So we can go ahead and see the mechanism of that. Uh, just go ahead and line that stud up there with the latch, tighten it down. Sometimes easier said than done. Um, something like that. It does have a, an adjustable uh, nut and bolt there if you need to add more tension to that tank. Uh, up top we have an open and closed valve there as your service valve. Um, you know, I find most people are generally pretty familiar with these propane cylinders. It's of course up to you on whether you want to keep this tank with this unit. You can take advantage of any exchange program at filling stations, things like that. That's absolutely up to you. Uh, up top here above that we have your refrigerator vent. Now that's going to be your access to your, excuse me, to your refrigerator vent. Uh, from a maintenance standpoint, there's really not too terribly much you're going to be doing from this area here. Uh, best practice is going to be to place a bug screen uh, within that vent, uh, keep any mud divers or flying insects from nesting within the compartment. Uh, really other than that, uh, give it a visual inspection a couple times a year, make sure nothing's gotten in, uh, make sure everything looks as it should, and uh, that's about it. So again, really not too terribly much we're going to do there. All your controls are going to be on the front side of the unit. Uh, they generally stay in good shape, but it goes without saying, give it a visual inspection a couple times a year. Uh, what we have here is going to be your potable water fill. Uh, we're going to go ahead and stick a garden hose directly in here. We're going to fill it up, do it overflows. Uh, once full, we cap it off. Now we do need to use that onboard, uh, excuse me, onboard water pump to pressurize that system, draw that water up to the fixture and make it usable. So this is going to be your off-grid option. Hopefully before you get there, you do have some access to water to go ahead and fill up that tank. Uh, we have your Atwood Dometic six gallon water heater here. Uh, now this is a dual source water heater, runs on 110 volt electricity, as well as propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition. Uh, you can go ahead and run it on both sources. That's going to give you the highest recharge rate, uh, something like 17 gallons per hour. If you're running it on standalone propane with 12 volt direct spark ignition, you're looking at like 15 gallons per hour. Last but not least, standalone electricity is going to be 11 gallons per hour. Uh, manufacturer has two very specific recommendations when it does come to operating this appliance. Number one, if it's going to be in storage for more than seven days, they do want to make sure you go ahead and drain the water heater separate of the system. Uh, number two is, of course, when returning the unit back to service, it is very important that we uh, prime it or fill it with six gallons of water before we go ahead and light it. Uh, now this is a porcelain line system. Uh, what that means for you is that there is no anode rod that would need to be replacing. If you're not educated on what an anode rod is, don't worry about it. It's, it does not uh, have a place within this unit. So uh, back to my initial points of, of draining it and filling it. Uh, that, that procedure is going to look something like this. Um, give it ample time to cool down. Of course, number one, at least two or three hours. Uh, once you are certain of the temperature, we're going to go ahead and depressurize the unit. Now you can use any internal, external fixture, water fixture to do so. Uh, we're going to focus on the hot side of that plumbing. You can go ahead and use the outside shower here, uh, whatever you choose, uh, as long as we're focusing on the hot side of the plumbing. So initially we're going to cut the inflow of water to the unit. So uh, for utilizing the potable water here, we're going to of course just flip off that water pump. If we're utilizing the city water connection, we can physically turn off the water at the valve. So once we have no new water entering the unit, we're going to go to any fixture uh, and we're going to turn the hot side of that fixture on. Once we do so, we're going to see a little bit of water come from that fixture, a little bit of pressure. Uh, once that water has ceased to, to evacuate that fixture, that is your indicator that you are depressurized here. You are then safe to drain it. Now, once depressurized, we're going to come here this has a 15 16 drain plug here. Now that is a nylon drain plug. Uh, I'll, I'll, once we are, uh, so 15 16 drain plug, uh, we're gonna go ahead and drain it. Now it is very important that we do keep that a nylon plug. Couple reasons why. Uh, number one, uh, Atwood Dometic markets that as a secondary safety feature. If the pressure within the unit were to gain to be uh, to an unsafe level and this automatic pressure relief valve were to fail, 
it's going to eventually overcome those threads, uh, spitting that plug out like a cork. Uh, if you go ahead and replace that with like a brass plug or something like that, uh, of course you are uh, nullifying that safety feature. Also will immediately avoid your warranty with Atwood Dometic if you put anything in there other than that nylon plug. Uh, on the flip side of that conversation, to prime that water heater or pump six gallons of water into the unit, uh, we're going to do that by, uh, again, uh, it's going to sound very familiar to depressurizing it, but uh, the exact opposite. So we're going to introduce water into the unit. Once we have new water flowing into the unit, we're then going to go to the hot side of any spigot. We're going to turn it on. From there, we're going to see uh, that flow be very airy, very uh, spitty, bubbly, uh, whatever you want to say uh, initially. And then once that, once that uh, flow normalizes, that really is our indicator that we have six gallons of water in here. We are then safe to go ahead and light it choosing our source again, whether that's 110 volt electricity uh, or propane gas. Uh, very big intrusion point for mud daubers and flying insects. All of these propane appliances are. Uh, it's definitely going to be my recommendation uh, that we do go ahead and um, further screen those in. So it is very important that we do screen those off. Uh, when closing this vent, you have a little tab here. You just want to make sure that that is uh, oriented in the correct position. We go ahead and give it a pull, rotate it. It's going to go ahead and lock it on. Uh, we have your furnace vent here. Uh, again, not what we would consider a customer serviceable unit. Uh, there's just really not too terribly much you're going to do from this area here. Uh, this is the exhaust, so it does blow very hot air when it is on. Uh, will melt whatever you put in front of it. Again, we're going to want to put a bug screen. Uh, we're going to want to place a bug screen over it. Uh, make sure that we are choosing a screen uh, that has a wide enough um, gauge or whatever, uh, big enough openings to go ahead and not restrict the flow. So we don't want to keep, we do want to make sure we are keeping that free flowing. Uh, taking a look down low here, a um, couple things going on. Uh, here we have your cable satellite inlets. So those just are some RG6 cable fittings. Uh, that's going to be a pass-through cable connection to the designated TV area of the camper. Again, designed for a, not only a park cable service, but a aftermarket satellite package as well. Uh, so they do just feed through the wall to the designated TV area. They're gonna allow you to inlet some of those services. And again, gonna be a little hard to see here. Uh, underneath this wing, we're going to have some, some water inlets. Uh, this first one's going to be your city water connection. Now, water pressure becomes very important when we talk about city water. Uh, we're going to want to keep that water pressure in between 40 and 75 PSI. Uh, you're going to be, with your purchase, is going to include a water pressure regulator. The one that we include regulates that pressure in between 40 and, 7, 40 and 50 PSI, but the unit's working water pressure is in between 40 and 75 PSI. Uh, so if you, if that pressure regulator that we include does not uh, um, exceed your expectations in terms of water pressure, feel free to upgrade as long as you're not exceeding that 75 PSI limit, you're going to be in good shape. Uh, with any water pressure regulator that's going to hook directly onto the spigot side or as close to the water source as you can, your hose is going to connect onto that and then ultimately making this transition here onto the trailer bound connection by again rotating that trailer connection here. Uh, down below that, we have a black tank flush. Now that corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank, specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. It's a really nice feature. It works tremendously well. It ha helps uh, any compounding of, of body waste, things like that within the inside of the tank. It's gonna keep your tank sensors in good shape, uh, things like that. Now it does have a limitation. It does have some limitations. So, uh, those limitations are that there is no check valve uh, to keep that water within the tank in the event that you uh, inadvertently overflow it. So what I recommend my customers to do is do ne never allow water to flow within that tank for longer than five minutes. Uh, and you should be kind of uh, uh, switching from this position to the inside, taking a look at that monitor panel, making sure that that tank is not going to be overflowed. Uh, path of least resistance is the rooftop septic vents. So if you leave water running indefinitely into that tank, you're going to eventually see a transition from the roof line. Uh, works very well. Again, I recommend most of my customers go ahead and take advantage of that uh, tank flush every single time they take the unit out. Uh, 
when it does come to empty it, you're going to go ahead and use the black water valves. Uh, we're going to focus more on that here when we get to that compartment uh, where those are housed. Uh, up top here again, we have your um, outside shower. Uh, works very well, access to hot and cold water. Here on the head, you have a hard on off switch. Uh, what I've seen is that since you don't constantly see water flowing here, sometimes people forget that they have the valves on here. This conveniently feeds up there into the cabinetry. And if this uh, on off switch is not uh, seated fully, you can go ahead and close this door. That's gonna go ahead and, and inadvertently, or can inadvertently turn it on, uh, leaking some water into the interior of your camper. So something to keep in mind there, just a little warning. Um, here, uh, not too terribly much. Of course, we have your um, you know, storage compartments, things like that. Uh, really nothing that we need to discuss here uh, in this presentation. Coming around here to the backside, we of course have your uh, ladder access here. Uh, great time to talk about general structural maintenance of the units. Uh, anywhere where two pieces come together, there's going to be some sort of sealant. Here on the body, that's going to be 100% silicone product. We want to uh, catch any degradation as soon as we can. So whether that's going to be cracks, uh, peeling, whatever, uh, we want to, of course, touch up as necessary. Stop any uh, water intrusion as soon as possible. On the roof, generally what you're going to find is a uh, RV grade self-leveling lap sealant with, uh, I believe Lance uses a butyl backed roof tape. If you see any peeling of those products, again, any degradation, make sure that we are touching them up and we're gonna be inspecting once every 90 days because if we do have any issues, we wanna catch it as soon as possible. Uh, very, very, very important to maintain. Uh, here we have your uh, auxiliary battery terminals. Uh, because the batteries within this unit are housed in a um, sealed battery box within the camper, uh, they're not easily accessible. So what Lance has done is they give you some auxiliary uh, battery terminals there. That way if you have to do any battery maintenance, any charging, check voltage, things like that, you can do so from this location so you don't have to dig them out of their sealed battery boxes. Now you will, now those batteries do carry, the batteries that we will install within the unit do carry some maintenance. Once every 90 days, you're going to want to check the water levels within those batteries by pulling the vent panels up off the top of those batteries and refilling with distilled water as necessary. So it is very important, uh, again, that we are checking those water levels and we are maintaining them as necessary. They're going to keep those batteries in tip top shape. Uh, beside that, we have some all-weather 110-volt outlets, nothing too fancy there. Uh, again, just some 15-amp outlets. Now, beside that, uh, we have a lot going on in this particular location. So, um, you can see these hose here. Uh, now, if we trace those hose back a little further, they're going to lead to a valve. Now, these are your low-point drains. That's going to be the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. Everything in between water source and fixture is going to be drained from this location here. Uh, that's good for just general maintenance because, again, we're going to want to keep this unit free of water if it is going to be in storage for more than seven days. But you're also going to go ahead and utilize these for winterization, things like that. Now, the third one is going to be how you drain your freshwater holding tank, uh, your potable water, however you want to reference it. Those all three are going to be drained from this location. So kind of to bring things full circle here, we would go ahead and open all these valves, let all that water drain from this location. We would then go over to the water heater and drain that separately. If we do those four things, 99.9% uh, .9 of the water within the unit is going to be evacuated. Also, excuse me, in this compartment, we have your gray and your black water dump valves. Now black water is gonna be anything that comes from the toilet. So we're looking at solid body waste, toilet paper, things like that. Gray water is going to be anything that comes from the sink or the shower. Now these valves transition through the frame and we have a bayonet style fitting there on the underside. Now your sewage hose is going to connect the very same way your cap comes off. What that's going to look like is you have four prongs along the outside. You're going to put the keyhole of the cap in the halfway position, give it a quarter turn. Now even when you are hooked up to full time septic via a sewage hose, something like that, this black water is going to maintain or this, got, this black water valve is going to remain in the closed position. Uh, reason being is we wanna keep that wet, as wet as possible. So we need that solid body waste, that toilet, toilet uh, paper to flow from the tank when we do go to pull that valve. 
The easiest way to do that is, again, keep that in as wet or flowing condition as we can. Uh, gray water right beside it, of course, that's not as important. Uh, there is no solid waste. That's absolutely up to you on whether you keep that open or closed during use. Just keep in mind that these two valves should never be open at the same time. And it is a very popular option for people to go ahead and dump their black water valve and then use their gray water to uh, rinse any shared plumbing as well as the rinse, rinse uh, any shared plumbing as well as their septic hose on the way out. Uh, moving on, um, coming around here to the side, not too terribly much going on here. Uh, we have your outside speakers, uh, porch light, things like that. Going to take a look here under the wing, make sure we're not missing anything. Uh, and we got nothing under here. So we're going to hop on the inside, start taking a look at those features in there. We'll see you in there. So here we have your jack remote here. Um, now this is going to give you full function over those wireless jacks. Um, so when we look at this, of course, I already turned it on. Uh, you're going to do that with this center button here. Once you see that blue light, that is your indicator. Now you have a couple options here. You can, of course, this is labeled driver and passenger side, uh, which is, of course, very easy to figure out. Generally, our orientation is going to be from the rear. We're kind of backwards right now, so uh, don't let that confuse you. Just kind of focus on the driver and the passenger side here. Uh, this is going to be driver side front, driver side rear, passenger side front, passenger rear or we can hit all jacks here. And that's gonna go ahead and raise them up or down here. Now we can run any, t any two as well. So if I uh, turn this on and then I would say, hold these two buttons down, it's gonna light up both of those. That would be the driver side, um, both of those driver side jacks. So very easy to, to operate that. Um, does run on batteries. Uh, very important that you're gonna keep a spare battery uh, with the unit. It does accept a 23A battery. Uh, there is no backup remote, uh, so it is very important that you do keep a spare battery. Now these, 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 uh, these jacks, they do have a manual drive option here on the inside. We're going to find a crank handle. Uh, it is very uh, evident where you're going to place that crank handle on the jack to, to uh, manually operate that. But just keep in mind, of course, if this stops working, uh, you still have the ability to go ahead and um, uh, load and unload the camper. So also here in the doorway, we see your fire extinguisher. This is part of your safety equipment. It's very important that we do taste, test all of our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. Uh, for the fire extinguisher, we're gonna push the green test tab down. If it springs back, that means we still have life in the units. Uh, if not, it is time to pull out and replace. So very important that we're testing all of our safety equipment uh, before using the unit. We, if in the event that we need it, we want it to be operational. Uh, here we have your main exterior light uh, clusters here. They are labeled in terms of uh, placement. Uh, exterior lights here, these are going to be the amber colored lights uh, on the outside. So you have three, again, left, right, rear. These are gonna be the amber colored lights. And then here on this one, this is gonna be your docking lights. So these are gonna be the bright white LEDs that we may have saw on the outside. Uh, again, very straightforward. Tons of light here on, on the external areas of this camper which is going to really light up your footprint uh, in the event that you have to do any work outside the unit after dark. Uh, coming into the unit here further, uh, in this compartment here, um, you know, this is of course gonna be your main uh, closet space, your biggest storage compartment it does have the hanging rack. Um, you know, previous owner has installed some, some other hangers and things like that. Uh, these are going to be your, um, jack crank handles your manual option what i rep which i referenced uh earlier uh again um if you have any questions on where to place that we can go ahead and of course walk you through that on the phone or, or take a look at that operation a little bit more um bathroom here uh so we have a wet bath here uh really nothing again nothing too crazy or earth shattering here very indicative of what you would see with a standard wet bath uh, pedal flush on the commode there. That's going to be a light press to fill up the bowl, full press to flush. Uh, always want to keep some water in the toilet. That's going to help keep the bad smells down. Uh, you know, always use a single ply RV grade toilet paper, uh, tissue dissolver, deodorizer. Um, if you have any questions on which products to use, don't hesitate to give our parts department a call. They'd be more than happy to go ahead and educate you on the uh, proper uh, products to use in that scenario. We also have a 12 volt exhaust fan within the 
the bathroom here, you'll see that on off toggle switch here, very straightforward. Uh, we do want to make sure we are closing all of our vents before going down the road, so it is very important. Um, shower head has an on off switch that's in the um, the design to go ahead and, and conserve as much water consumption as possible. Probably find yourself doing military Navy style showers, things like that. Uh, of course, shower curtain here, we have it tied up, uh, but that's to allow you to keep this door open, give you a little bit more room to move around uh, when you are in here. Again, nothing too earth shattering here with a wet and dry bath. If you've seen one, you've kind of seen them all. Uh, of course, being that you're purchasing a truck camper, I'm pretty sure you kind of know what you're getting yourself into with that. Um, closing the door here does have a lock button there that's going to keep that door stationary when you're going down the road so it's not uh, open and closing every time you hit your brakes. Uh, here into the kitchen area, we uh, coming up here we have your thermostat for your furnace. Uh, now this has a hard on off switch here on the left so we're or on the top so we're going to pull that to the left to turn it on. That's going to kick that blower motor on immediately. 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Uh, generally, in a unit of this size, uh, you are going to have that set off your smoke alarm. Uh, it's unavoidable. The manufacturer uh, of the furnace uh, states that that is, that is absolutely to be expected. The, the efficiency of the appliance only increases once it runs. And then down low here, we have your actual thermostat control. Uh, that's going to control your comfort level. It's not an exact science, but uh, you'll figure out what uh, makes the most sense for you in terms of temperature. Uh, on off switch here on the light, a nice LED light strip, gonna light that way here. Um, bathroom light switch here. So uh, that's how we turn the light there on in the, the bathroom. Um, standard kind of run of the mill camping stove cooktop here. Uh, again, really nothing too, too crazy or out of the realm. Uh, it is just a cooktop, uh, very, very basic. Doesn't have a spark or igniter. Uh, not a bad idea to keep a, keep a long stem barbecue with uh, lighter with the unit. Uh, when it does come to lighting it, we're just gonna turn it to light here. Uh, hold our flame directly onto the burner until it lights. Then we can choose a high or a low flame depending on our needs. Uh, we have your Jensen stereo here. Now this is going to give you function to CD, DVD, AM, FM radio, also Bluetooth connectability. That is all very easy to access uh, through these push button modes here, on off button here. Uh, again, I find most people can really kind of work themselves around these units. One thing to note is you do have separate zones here of speakers. Of course, two internal zones, one in the bedroom, one here in, above the table. And then you have external speakers as well. Those external speakers are going to be on C. I encourage my customers to always kind of check that, that third zone. Make sure you're, whatever you're broadcasting here on the inside, you're not inadvertently uh, playing for the outside world to hear. Uh, carbon monoxide LP leak detector here. Uh, now that is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper. Um, so no batteries to change, anything like that, but it is a very important part of your safety equipment. So we do want to go ahead and make sure we are testing it along with the other safety equipment. Uh, it does have a test button. It's going to alert you of which gas it is sensing uh, by a series of flashing lights and a corresponding scale to tell you whether that's carbon monoxide uh, or, of course, uh, LP gas. Uh, also, we have a charging section here. You have a cigarette lighter style 12 volt receptacle couple USBs uh, to charge any phones, anything like that. Beside that, we have a couple 110 volt outlets. Again, nothing too out of the realm there. Now this dinette area does make a secondary sleeping area. Uh, what that is going to entail is we're of course going to unbuckle the tabletop there. We're gonna go ahead and wrestle that tabletop from the pedestal, then remove the pedestal. From there, that tabletop's gonna go ahead and sit right here on these ledges. And then we do go ahead and take this back cushion and let that fill out the rest of the tabletop. So it does make a great sleeping area. So what we have here is gonna be your fuse panel breaker box. Everything here on the left side is gonna be a replaceable automotive blade style fuse. Uh, of course, it's not a bad idea to pick a variety pack of fuses, keep them with the unit uh, in the event that you ha would have one burn out and you would need a replacement. Everything there on the right side of that unit is going to be a resettable 110 volt breaker. Same variance you're going to find in your fuse panel box at home. Uh, in terms of function, everything is labeled on each side uh, for each side on the door there. So very easy. Uh, coming up top here, we have your um, 
your your uh, three-way refrigerator. Um, now, this does run on 110 volt electricity. It does run on 12 volt DC, as well as propane gas. So starting down here, all the way down, that's going to be 12 volt um, battery. It's denoted by the light there on the, of the battery display. Now, uh, one thing to talk about. Now, these ammonia absorption systems in general are, are pretty widely known to be inefficient on that 12 volt uh, source. Uh, they, they are very, very power hungry. They, they, they uh, use a lot of energy. Uh, a lot of times, if you're, if you're driving just a, a stock pickup truck without a high, alter, a high output alternator, uh, it can be tough for that truck to kind of keep up with that, the supply uh, that this takes, not only charging your battery down here, but charging your uh, battery on your vehicle. It's our opinion as a dealership to very much use at your own risk. Make sure you educate yourself on the proper use of a 12 volt ammonia absorption refrigerator, of course, before you inadvertently leave yourself stranded. Uh, so above that, we're gonna go ahead and turn to electricity. Now, let me back up a little and say on that, no matter if we're using a 12 volt uh, uh, DC option or we're using the 110 volt option, our temperature control is going to be this guy here. So make a visual representation right down the center. Everything on the right side of that line is gonna be utilized for propane. Everything here on the left side is gonna be utilized for electricity. So we go ahead and we, we choose our temperature. Again, it's not an exact science. I think you have a cold, colder, and coldest here. You'll have to figure out what works for you, what's gonna keep your uh, food from freezing, but keep it cold enough. And again, we're gonna use this temperature control for both electric sources. Now, when I come up here to propane gas, we can go ahead and turn this all the way off because that's null and void at this point. We are now gonna go ahead and use this guy here. Now, just like lighting any other pilot driven device, we're gonna go ahead and turn this to high propane output and we're gonna hold that button in. Now, if you haven't lit the, the, if you haven't lit the refrigerator for a long time on propane, uh, it can be slightly pro problematic because those lines, uh, those propane lines have evacuated their gas and they have now filled up with air. Uh, this appliance is very efficient on propane gas. What that can mean though, is that it can take a, a good amount of time to uh, displace that air and, and give you a fresh pool of gas. So I will generally tell my customers, if it's been a long time since lighting it on gas, sit here with your finger on the button for 30 seconds to a minute before you even try to start lighting it. Uh, when you're fairly confident that you have expressed that air, you're gonna go ahead and spark this piezo igniter here, just like you're lighting an electric grill. You're gonna go ahead and spark that as rapidly as you can. That's gonna give you a higher likelihood of it lighting. Now this little gauge here, what that's going to be is your visual representation of your thermal coupler. So uh, what I'm getting at, as I, while I'm holding this, as I'm sparking this, I'm gonna be looking at this window. I'm gonna look for that little red line. I'm gonna look for the point where that is well within that green and I'm gonna keep sparking it until it does. Once it's about halfway into that green, I can go ahead and release my hand from this. That thermal coupler is going to allow that propane to continue to flow and it will run from there on out. Uh, and then again, don't forget when we're done using that, that we go ahead and turn that knob off uh, all the way to off. So very straightforward. Uh, nine volt smoke alarm here above my bed. Uh, does run on a nine volt battery. Uh, does have a test button. Um, you know, very, very indicative of what you normally see with the smoke detector. Um, you know, same as, same as what you would have at home. Uh, air conditioner here above my head. Uh, controls are built directly into the unit itself. Uh, you have two fan modes. So you have low fan, high fan, and then you have low cool. So that's air conditioner with a low fan speed and then high cool, which is air conditioner with a high speed. And then we have a thermostat here to uh, fine tune that setting if we choose to do so. Of course, your indicator is gonna be up here. So that, that's, so we're, we're of course turning it off. Our indicator is here. Now, all of these lights here on the ceiling, they all each have their own switch. So there's little slider switches on each light. Uh, we're just gonna go ahead and turn those all on and off independently. It's very easy to do. Uh, battery is going to be housed underneath um, this, this cab over here, just for your information. Uh, it is going to be a brand new interstate deep cycle battery, but that is going to be where it is housed. 
Uh, coming up here into the bed area of the camper, um, not too terribly much to speak of up here, uh, but we have your fantastic fan here. Um, we can go ahead and crank this open and you have a thermostat here so it can kick on and off throughout the night to maintain that temperature. And then you have three, spans, three fan speeds here. Now this is an exhaust only fan. The idea being that you're going to open up these side windows and that's going to be powerful enough to uh, give you a nice cross breeze of air. Uh, should work fairly well for that purpose. Uh, it does have a little fuse holder in the event that this ceases to work. Uh, make sure you go ahead and check that fuse. It uh, may save you some time in the long run. Uh, other than that, here up in the bed area, uh, we have reading lights on each side of the bed and the switch is going to be right there on the fixture. Uh, that just about covers it here on the inside of the 825. If you do have any questions or concerns, anything that we may have forgotten, uh, please feel free to give us a call. Thank you.